Hello and welcome to another session of Other Two Cents. In this episode, we're discussing banking and finance in the black community. And our guest today to discuss the topic with us is Samuel Gann. Samuel, welcome to Other Two Cents. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, um, I'm feeling a bit relaxed today. Like I said earlier, the kids have been um, carefully sent over to the grandparents to spend some quality time. So uh, you have some silence today. It's a real privilege to have someone with your background on this podcast to discuss, particularly banking and finance, because it isn't really a topic that you get a lot of coverage on from our community. If you could start off by giving us a little bit about your background, how did you end up in banking and finance? So, um, well, the background first, as you know, I'm a Ghanaian born. I uh, was born in Ghana, but I've grown up in this country. I think I've now lived here a bit longer than uh, I lived in Ghana. I always studied the kind of sciences. So, uh, the mathematics, because uh, growing up in a Ghanaian household, if you did anything that was h- hardcore science, uh, it was considered, you know, intelligent. So um, luckily I was good at it, so I did that. Uh, um, my first proper job as I came out of university was with Lloyd's Banking Group when they had um, gotten in trouble with the PPI fiasco. I went from there to working with... Uh, the church commissioners which is the investment arm of the church of england and then went from there to standard and poor's where i covered banks and um, insurance uh, banks and insurance companies so standard and poor's the ratings agency and then from there um i ended up in banking you know what it's it's a tough area to be in it's a it's a tough area to be in Simply because less for the the mental aptitude needed or the intellectual aptitude needed. It's more the politics in that area. It's quite it's a contrast to what you learn at home and learn in other parts of society. Banking is very much about the numbers, and that's across the board. Um, when you talk to other human beings and things like that, it's about the numbers. If you're, it's either you're performing or you're not. But you do get to meet some decent human beings in there. So I can't throw the, the baby out to the bathwater. But it, it, it is a challenging area to be in. And um, to try to make it to the top is even more so challenging. So how have, you, how have I found, found it? I found it? I found it stimulating and... Uh, the most interesting ride I've ever been on. Oh, wow. So that's, that's definitely an interesting way to put it. I mean, what I find particularly interesting with, you know, high, high flying, highly successful uh, members of the black community who work in these particular industry sectors is they are so few and far between that, you know, typically on my journey into central London and I, my background is in IT, you know, you see so few Black people suited up, heading to work, <laughs> typically in the mornings, um, that you see just how few people are in those sorts of positions. I mean, from, from the viewpoint of the Black community, is there anything specifically you, you'd like to share with us in terms of trying to make it through the career path that you've chosen? Yeah, it, 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 it's such a loaded question right there. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a case of how far down the rabbit hole do you really want to go? The, the, the thing is, the, you have to ask yourself, is that a career path you want, firstly? And if you do, um, it, that, that's, a, that's an important question to answer. And in terms of making it through there, the age old saying, you have to be good at what you do. But most black people surprisingly are good when it comes to the academics i've met a lot of very intelligent black africans especially we are actually quite high achievers when it comes to the academics what i realized i had to really learn very quickly is the politics and the relationship management within those sectors i don't find too many of us being very good at that um, and I struggled with that at the beginning. 
depending on a t- kind of typical household you've grown up in, um, how we socialize is very different. And a lot of black people tend to um, struggle, especially Africans from religious backgrounds, struggle with the socializing aspect of it. So it's less, so anyone that wants to go down that path, the intellectual side of things goes without saying, but you cannot, cannot underestimate the need to manage relationships properly and socialize properly because who you know does matter whether you like it or not who you know does matter especially after a certain point it matters and we're, we're not very good at that i don't know uh, maybe because uh, uh let me not digress right i'm honestly glad that you've touched on that point specifically on the politics the interpersonal skills the the way we socialize it is such a critical bit of the of the british psyche the british culture and the hierarchy system i think it takes pretty much every black person that i know in industry like you said initially it takes them by surprise it's it's amazing how critical it's almost as important if not more important how you're perceived and how you relate to people in the workplace um um as compared to how actually technically brilliant you are. I know lots of brilliant people who don't get very far because of the, some of the things that you've highlighted. So I'm, I'm really glad you've touched on that. Another thing we have in common is we, we both went through Bruno University. I did my undergrad there, yes. and I understand you yes. did your master's there. Do you want to touch a little bit about that? You know, um, I actually did the second undergrad there. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me why my my master's level um, degree. Well, I did a professional qualification. I did that at Cambridge, and again, that that's another whole conversation. Um, but um, my time at Bruno was great. I met some amazing people there. Studied financial mathematics there. It, it's a bit of a nice community, man. Um, you, you meet other black people there that are really ambitious want to do something with themselves you know and everyone is on that hustle trying to push but it's a different kind of hustle you're no longer in the street corners or you know just trying to sell at a stall um so hustle in front of books and a hustle in front of uh computers and things like that. but i loved it i love that place uh, i don't know if you um your time there you heard the phrase brew what brew no i loved it i loved it <laughs> absolutely uh, the social scene at Brunel was incredible. I mean, the, the campus yeah. vibe, the, you know, the mix of people, it was incredible. Situated in West, West London, of course, meant that you got a, a, a pretty good cross-section of people coming there. And there was a particularly strong contingent of the Afro-Caribbean uh, community in Brunel as well, uh, which, was, which, which made it even more interesting. Now, Coming back a little bit to the, to the uh, banking and finance uh, topic of discussion, you had some ventures in, in trying to work with a, a group of guys to set up a bank. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so banking, um, I think it's very often underestimated and a lot of people don't understand why banking has remained the backbone of uh, a lot of economies for so long. And um, in in the black community, not that we underestimate it, but we haven't spent as much time to try and harness the potential that banking has. So uh, I got into it um, because I used to meet with a group of um, predominantly young black um, people within London. Those somewhere in business, somewhere working trying to work their way up and the whole point was to network and try to see if we can help each other uh, move up the career ladder or um, find funding for different ventures that we were involved in and i would typically find someone who was an expert in a particular field to come and do a master class I don't know, in any particular area that was um, of interest to the rest of the group, we would find someone who's a specialist in that area to come do a bit of a masterclass on there and get um, get questions from the group. As you know, knowledge is absolutely power. And if you're well equipped with information, there's a, there's a lot that you can achieve. So we used to do that. And what kept coming up 
was the lack of financing or and even when it came to mortgages and trying to get on the um, property ladder especially in london in london um, i knew a lot of people with great jobs and when they were by themselves it was okay and then they got married they met the man or woman of their lives and they decided to get married and the dynam dynamics change very rapidly as soon as you have a child or you want to get a proper home you realize how very little your money can do because even if you had a good income trying to get the that deposit for um for a down payment for a house was now impossible in london and people were having to move out to london to but still working in london so the some of them were ridiculous i know i knew one guy who was living in birmingham working in london so his wow. round trip every day was about four hours he if he was lucky he got back in time to say good night to his um baby girl and his daughter before um they would go to sleep so it's ridiculous that you live in london adding to the london economy but couldn't afford to live there so yeah i decided to explore different ideas of can we can we combat this is there something we can do with all these brains we have here surely there's something we can do and obviously at that point you start doing a checklist through all the different financing ideas that pop up within our community there's something in ghana called sisu um where different people put uh, money together in a pot then hand it over to someone at the end of the month um it's been done successfully in a lot of places and the the only limitation with that is that it's not scalable because the amount of trust you need to be able to make something like that function well can't be scaled because you can't maintain that trust level once it gets beyond about 15 and then this so i looked at that then i looked at um becoming maybe a credit union and credit unions in the uk i don't know how much you've looked into them none of them have made money ever they all lose money they're okay. supported but, uh, the, but that's interesting why, why do you think that is why, why are they all losing money oh it's, it's, it's a credit uh, it's a business model um the, the, then the, they're designed in a way it's, it's supposed to be able to um be a safer net for those that are not uh, as um high on the income spectrum you do get some wealthy people that do that but um uh, so that's one limitation because the kind of income you have coming in is never really going to be that large the other thing is that credit unions in the uk especially are never really big enough a bank needs to be big enough to be able to make a reasonable margin because you can't try to make an absolute killing on one transaction it has to be small haircuts that's why in banking we call it haircuts it has to be almost negligible but you get a large quantity credit unions are not big enough so they have to be um they have to be uh uh supported by the local councils and different organizations um so all the socially um conscious kind of financial institutions in the UK don't really make money um i mean if you look at canada or america some of them do so i looked at that and i thought that's not a good business model either and then i thought i mean we could start a bank obviously at that point everyone thinks i've lost my mind Right. because at that point I, I had never started a bank before and how the heck do you even do that but the the eureka moment for me is that the recourse recourse um having that security there um to be able to look at the regulator to ensure that your money was safe rather than putting your trust in a single person you do need to trust the people managing it the, the, they need to have the abc's of banking as they say they need to be aligned with you they need to be benevolent be benevolent uh, in the way they handle your money and they need to be competent that's um uh, very important but you need to know that should something go completely wrong you had recourse and i looked at them and i thought the only structure that has that is a bank so now how do i marry that with being able to create something that all of us can share in so that if it does well we all do well so kind of like a cooperative but the uk had never had hadn't had a, a cooperative bank in the uk i think ever the co-op in the uk is not really a cooperative um we can get into the technicalities of that another time okay. uh, and 
Um, the UK's last um, standing community bank fell away in 2018. It was called Airdrie Bank. It was in Scotland. So I thought, how do I create something that's cooperative? It's, a, it's based around a community and it has the factors, the qualities of a bank to create um, that security and also the ability to recycle wealth. That bit is, I get really excited about that. It sounds geeky, but that's, that's the crux of it. If the ability to recycle wealth, the multiplier effect, people think it's a scandal or some secret, but that's the secret source that makes banks, you know, the backbone of economy. So I looked at all of that and I thought, surely we can do it. There are so-called African banks in the UK, but let's discuss that in a bit. They're not serving that purpose. And that's how I got into it. Um, I know um, I've gone on a bit about that. Um, it's a topic that I touch on and I, I get carried okay. away, but um, it, 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 it's that whole transition. Um, different models are there, but if you really want to build something that's sustainable and scalable to do with finances, it had to be a bank. Right. So, I mean, the motivations, your reasons for getting into this, I think are, are, are quite clear. Um, clearly, it, it was something that you were excited about. How was the journey? How did you, how did you end up, um, I guess, getting the whole thing started? What resources did you have to access? Uh, you know, what team? How did the team come together, et cetera? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So... No joke. I'm not lying. Um, we, um, and I'm putting that caveat because this is going to sound ridiculous. Um, the first thing I did when I went and opened my mouth to this group that I think we should start a bank and I'm going to find out how we do it. So I went on Google and I Googled, how do you start a bank? Um, obviously, um, I Googled that, but I knew other aspects that I needed to look at because I had been taking, uh, looking after banks and insurance companies with S&P. So, I knew the basics of how a bank works, the mechanics of how a bank works. Ultimately, it's not really that complex. A bank keeps money safe for you. Um, it lends you money. It keeps your thing safe for you. Um, it, give, uh, it gives you the ability to save money and get some interest on it, and it lends you money. It also gives you access to the payment systems. It, uh, uh, so if you want to be a bit more technical, it takes short-term risk uh, and, and translates it into long-term risk. So it's not that complicated. So uh, um, I started from there and I started looking at it and I started Googling and I, um, I made a list of different people that I came across that had some experience in that area. I think I came up with a list of about 50 people that I wanted to contact to find out how on earth do I start a bank when, especially when I don't have my own capital. Right. You, you just don't do that if you don't have your own capital. So I, it was not a wing and a prayer. I had gone and said to people, I'm going to look into this. So when I got that list of people, I took some time off work. I spent two days cold calling people, I cold call people. And something strange happened as I called people. I called people and my, my pitch was literally, look, um, this, um, for this ABCD reasons, um, I want to start a bank. My background, um, uh, roughly speaking, is this. I'm fairly confident that I can build a model for this, but what else do I need to do? And the responses were, really? That's interesting. So um, people didn't tell me I was crazy. I, I expected them to tell me I was crazy, but everyone said, that's interesting. I can't help you, but I know someone that can help you. So people kept referring other people. Right. So I ended up getting a good mix of black and white people that were supposedly experts in this field. And then something really strange happened after that. Most of the black people I spoke to fell into a few camps. So if we do this, how am I going to make money quickly? I said, you're not going to make money quickly. Um, this is something that's a long-term view. And let's, let's be brutally honest. Um, you, might be, uh, we, you might be able to make a good amount of money, but you won't see any solid money until maybe after 10 years and your children will probably end up being the ones okay. that benefit from this the most. Right. That wasn't good news for most of... Uh, I thought that was exciting to tell people, but most black, um, most black professionals that uh, were 
in, at the top of their game that I spoke to you. It was heartbreaking, really. Um, the, the, the general sense was, oh, I mean, if I'm going to have to wait to 10 years, I can't waste my time on that. Right. So <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me press you on this. I mean, you, you've laid, I think, the foundations of how this thing got off the ground, you know, how you, <laughs> you got the green shoots in the first place. But in as, as brief an explanation as you can, how did you transition from that to getting to the point where the bank was actually established, um, you know, how, how long did it take? What what regulatory uh, hoops did you have to jump through? Uh, as briefly as you can. So, I, uh, um, before I really got off the ground, it took me about two and a half years by myself, trying to understand how everything worked, and then I finally um, decided to um, build a proper team uh, around me. I talked to different people. Um, I ended up with a team that on paper looked amazing. And then I had to start the, um, I obviously have to get a license to be able to do this. So I had to um, engage with um, the PRA, the um, Prudential Regulation Authority, and the um, FSA, the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, I needed to engage with them. Um, they had changed the rules on how you could start a bank slightly. So there was a, a new department set up called the New Bank Startup Unit. And there was a new law that came in in 2014 called, called the Community, Communities and Cooperative Benefits Act of 2014. What that did was that it allowed cooperatives to be able to raise the, the necessary capital needed to be able to start something up like a bank. So I, was, um, I got the ball rolling. I hunted around for people to form my, my board of directors because as energetic as I was and everything, uh, and as much as I was confident I could build this, I needed um, some some other people on the board to give investors the confidence that this could be done. So. Um, I managed to make some interesting partnerships and I say interesting at the time I thought it was great partnerships. I say it's interesting now um, because once I made those interesting partnerships, I was able to then um, form partnerships with KPMG um, to help with um, what you, you, you call the regulatory business plan, which is what you need to um, submit to um, the regulators to be able to start that process of getting a banking license. So I needed to get that. So I partnered, um, uh, they came on board to help with that. Then um, Linklaters became the legal entity of choice. Um, and I'll leave it as that. They became the legal entity of choice um, uh, uh, to help with the uh, the constitution and things like that that needed to be put together because okay. these things are not something you can do by yourself. So um, it was very much bringing a whole bunch of experts together. And the crux of it where I came into my own is I needed to find uh, more talent and I needed to find 20 million to make this happen. Um, so I went to market to look for the talent which I found and to look for 20 million which I found. And then um, I had all the primary components in place to be able to uh, tick off all the boxes required by the um, regulator to be able to um, really start getting scrutinized as a viable bank, basically. And then from there, there are other technical steps that you need to take where they scrutinize and interrogate the financial model that you put together. It's not by any stretch of the imagination uh, uh, a short journey or an easy job to be done, but that that's in a nutshell, as brief as I can. I don't think that was that brief either, but hopefully I gave you enough meat there. So I think, I think this is, um, this is particularly interesting because start to finish, you hinted about what, two and a half years, did you say? Uh, um, two and a half years to get up to scratch. To get to this, the, the, the very points that you made, as in having the money, having all the uh, uh, the I's dotted, the T's crossed with regards uh, submission to the regulators and everything else. Uh, no, um, two and a half years to really have a model in place that I could pitch to people. Right. To really get behind it. Sure. Um, how, how did the how, from did, how, that, long, how long did the, the whole thing take? to the point where you were ready to sort of actually pick that, well, submit to the regulators to, to, to get the uh, rubber stamp of, of approval, as it were. Once I got off the mark, it took about a year. A year. It, so in total, you were looking at what, three and a half years? 
three and a half years. So two and a half years, I was still working. That year, I quit my job to jump on this um, full time. And anyone that wants to do a business, if you plan to quit your business, uh, your 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 secure job, don't take that decision lightly because. But the vast majority of people don't have the option of quitting their jobs. They often have to kick it off as, as side hustles. So would you consider yourself to have been in this position due to fortune, by accident, by design? Was this purely your own making in terms of being able to engineer that position to, to be able to quit your job and, 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 and pursue this full time? You know, um, as much as I'd love to say it's purely my own making, I think there's um, there's an element of just good fortune in there. And I have a Christian background, so there's an element of God's hand in there um, as well. So for two and a half years, it was a side hustle. Okay. For two and a half years, it was a side hustle. Okay. And it got to a point whereby I was fairly confident that I could quit my job and still keep my, my family eating. Okay. And so, keep my bills paid. Right. So I think it was important to touch on that because it's worth people knowing that you did all this, right, as a side hustle initially. And if nothing else, to encourage those who are listening that are thinking, you know, I have to do all this, you know, after nine to five and try and burn through all the work that I need to do to establish what I need to do it's important that people realize that you got to these heights by having to treat it as a side hustle. Um, now, it, it's pretty clear that by this point, things were looking quite good. Th- things were on the app. How did things start to change? How, how did it get to the position where things didn't quite turn out the way you expected? Or you know, how did you start to detect things weren't quite on the trajectory that you had, you had anticipated? So the money made it all the difference. The money started to change the mood. So at the beginning, um, to pay my team and pay myself, I think I raised in total about 220,000 K, um, to kind of help me build a team and make sure everything kept on ticking. And then, um, the 20 million, as we got the letters of intent, passing through and the and the contract um being um edited and coming back and got the due diligence done and we had their uh, firms look the investors firms look at the proposal they come it's exciting i mean you're on an absolute high because it's the steepest learning curve ever um i don't care how intelligent you think you are there's so much you realize you don't know and my brain is buzzing all the time i'm dealing with terms and conditions that i've never had to look at before contracts with detail designed to trick and screw you over and it's exciting we're getting this back the due diligence you know we have i'm fending off questions left right and center and then we get to 15 million and then we're stuck for a bit. Well, I'm stuck for a bit because I can't find the extra five million because one of the key investors has dropped out. So I find um, another two investors who don't decide to come in on my minimum of five million. The, one of them comes in at three, the other one comes in at two, and then I have twenty-one million. I mean, I've got a verbal, you know, um, commitment, and the, the the documents I've gone in, the contracts I've gone in, my my legal team have drafted. We sent it. It's getting exciting here. I mean, right. um, a, anyone that's ever worked on closing a big deal, you, you can you can feel it. You can't sleep. You're you're you're, you're sleeping and you're thinking about it. And then the final um, the final meeting comes where I shake hands and uh, representative of this particular institution. Uh, um, shakes my hand and says, yes, we're happy to come in at 3 million. We, we walk out to that meeting and the person I went to the meeting with, we looked at each other, we smiled and I start, I start punching the air. I mean, we've, we've, we, we've gotten somewhere. And then the boardroom um, dynamics changed. The politics started. People started meeting secretly behind my back. I had gotten myself in a place whereby I didn't have enough allies that um, understood where I was coming from ideologically. And that those were red flags that I ignored. 
at the beginning. That, that, that was the hardest lesson, le- lesson I learned, that in my excitement and in my naivety, I ignored certain red flags that ended up just causing a lot of high blood pressure. So yeah, um, it, it went wrong when um, the money came in, people started acting very differently. Right. So and, let me let me delve into that a little bit because um, there are a fair few things that I want us to go through and we're fast running out of time. But it, this is important because when you see they started acting differently, the whole reason why we're even doing this is to, is to raise awareness of, of how things play out and why uh, members of the Black community often tend to struggle or not achieve their potential. So if you can very briefly explain what sorts of things happened that changed the dynamic can you can you give specific examples of of how this manifested itself i found myself in a place whereby um i didn't have the allies that i felt um i needed to have um to be able to fight that off um and th- this is purely boardroom kind of, kind of sense so i guess the lesson there really is that i can't stress enough how important it is to build the right team not just competence but in terms of integrity and in terms of trust because when you build something from the ground up you're expo- um, you're exposing your vulnerabilities to whoever you're in partnership with and you have to trust that if a fight comes, then they've got your back. Not if a fight comes, they're hoping that you get um, uh, you get shot so that they can take your place. And, so, and um, let, let's, let's, let me just clarify there that you're, that you're speaking metaphorically when you say when a fight comes. <laughs> uh, 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 what do you call I don't remember the last time I, pick, I picked up my fist to actually fight. So I'm, I am absolutely categorically speaking metaphorically. I'm talking about... Uh, fight on paper, fight in the boardroom, fight with words, not not physical fight, not, not any actual physical violence. So let's be absolutely clear about that. Yeah. yeah. So um, that that's the thing. Build. Um, it's it's much better you don't build anything than build with the wrong people. The the ends do not justify the means. You mean that's on, the school on a, of thought? You mean on a personal level? Because it's no bad thing that you've created a bank or you, you've helped no. basically spearhead the movement, right? Is that a point you want to reconsider? Because if you do something good and maybe perhaps you've lost personally, is, is that still not a good thing you've done? Um, I t- this is the view I take to uh, um, take of life that um, a, a lot of people have different um, big philosophies about life. And, 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 and in my life, I try to be as happy as I can and I try to make as many people around me as happy as possible. So nothing is really that deep and no vision, no purpose is really that deep that you lose yourself. It's really not that deep. Life is too short. It's not about how, how big a business I can build or anything like that. I just want to wake up, be happy, and have the people around me, friends and loved ones, be happy. And so, so for me personally, I'm definitely of the school of thought that if you lose yourself in building something, it's really not worth it. Uh, I mean, we're talking about pulling down um, statutes at the moment. And um, one politician made a statement that one particular statue that was pulled down in Bristol shouldn't have been pulled down because he did so much good. But that so much good was built on the back of 80,000 slaves, 19,000 of them dying along the way. And because he did something good, does that erase all of that? For me, don't lose yourself in building a business. Um, Let's remember the objectives. uh, And if the cost is losing yourself, call me a softy. Call me Mm -hmm. fluffy. uh, uh, um, But uh, but I don't think it's worth it. Okay. So it's... I think it's pretty clear up to this point. Um, clearly, your background, I think, sets the scene. You know, your educational and, and uh, employment uh, expertise and experience up to, up to this point. Clearly, your passion for what you wanted to do. How, how did it all actually come to an end? I walked away from it. 
um, I, I walked away from it. It had become such a toxic environment. Um, just literally side room meetings, people trying to get rid of the chairman because the chairman would not go to their side, asking me to get rid of the chairman. And I, um, it just got really ridiculous. And my wife had been so gracious. She, she had put up with me um, working till 11 p.m. Sometimes I get home and I'm on the computer till 1 a.m. And we're supposed to go on date night. And please, babe, you understand. And she was so gracious. So we finally decided to take some time off and go to Ghana. And I asked the board, um, please, 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 even if someone is dying, don't contact me because I'm not good. I can't save them. I'm in Ghana. Let me have some time off with my friend, um, with my family, and don't contact me for anything. Can you believe I'm in Ghana, and I get a call, you know, to extend a boardroom battle that they decided to have whilst I was not here, and that was the final straw because, um, that, at that point I thought, you know what, it's not worth it anymore. Um, um, I've spent too much time fighting boardroom battles instead of delivering what I said I'll deliver. So I came and I wrote a resignation letter and I, I said to them, I'm off. I kept um, um, my stake in the bank, um, but I removed myself as an executive or as a director effective immediately. Um, I let the regulators know I had stepped away and that was it. It was that call chasing me, chasing after me to Ghana to bring a fight to me in Ghana whilst I had asked specifically to get some time off so that I can spend some time with my family. That was the final straw for me. Right, right, right. So how, how, after you resigned and you stepped away, how, how did that, what, what impact did that have on your personal life? How, how did that affect your outlook, you know, your standing, what, what you, you had decided or, or, or were deciding to do next? The one that I decided to step down for the first time in a long time, I sat in the living room and I played pointless games with my son. And I watched movies. I binge watched um, Netflix um, I watched random movies with my wife. I tried to catch up with the date nights that I had missed, order some takeaway that put extra um, uh, mass on my waistline. In a, it, it, it was the most relaxed I had been for a long time. And um, it gave me a really different perspective on, on, on life. Um, I, I, I was relaxed. I was relaxed for a very long time. So I hit out just away from anything for a while for at least a year i hit that and it was nice it, it, it was lovely my friend it was lovely that's good to hear now i mean we're coming towards the end of of, of our i guess our session but what i would like to hear um from you about is if you were to do this again what would you do differently now i think this probably is is probably the, the, the biggest uh, part of this discussion, in my view, because it's what would have made things right with regards to your original vision. And it's what everybody will be looking at to make sure that if they try to follow in your footsteps, that they get it right. So I'll ask again, what would you have done differently to have gotten the outcome you were originally expecting? I would have held out a bit longer to get the kind of team I wanted, the kind of team that fully bought into um, what I was trying to do, not just technically, but ideologically. Uh, uh, that, that's definitely the number one thing that I'd have done. And that's what I'm doing right now. With regards to advice to others, now I, I, you know, I ask this knowing that your background is, is, in, is, is finance and banking. But generally to all the, you know, budding entrepreneurs out there, what advice would you give them? You know, they trying to hold on a full-time full job probably at the minute, uh, perhaps already 
have a business or two in the, in the on the side them thinking of taking a huge venture as you did what potential advice would you want to give those sorts of people be passionate about something but as passionate as you are don't be too precious about it be ready to pivot and pivot and pivot the only thing that stays constant is your objective the vehicle with it, uh, through which you achieve that objective be flexible about it maintain your passion maintain your objective but be absolutely flexible to pivot pivot and pivot and above all remember nothing in life is really that deep if you stop enjoying what you're doing if the people around you stop enjoying what you're doing you've probably lost focus in what's important nothing is that deep try to be happy do all of that be as great as you want to be but try to make sure you're not miserable doing it it's really not that deep right right so i think that's that's really sound advice and um one thing i'm i'm quite keen to hear what you have to say about uh is given all that you've said given where you are in life now what are you looking forward to in the future you know i've so i've spent the last maybe um 12 month uh 18 months just in hibernation i found a, a beautiful startup that um i was working with it was nice to be an employee again um uh, find a good small team and then covid happened but it um once I, once i hit out um once you develop this habit of working on the side you never lose it so i had already started redesigning what i wanted to look like in the future i just wanted to stay on the ground for a bit redesign it take a different approach build a new team and then covid happened so i stepped up my efforts um so right now um i've been seeing a lot of questions being asked about is there are there any black banks in the uk for example and i know people have cited FN uh, FNB First National Bank Nigeria GHIB Union Bank Guarantee Bank and things like that and I I think they are banks to be celebrated but it's also very important um we remember one thing they've been in existence since um some of them since 1983 and the youngest one maybe since 2007 and we were still asking the question are there any black banks and that should tell people something there are no banks designed for the average black person you know um the banks that tell us that there are well off black people out there africans out there and that's nothing to knock that's something to celebrate but there still remains a um, space for something that is designed for not just the wealthy but the also the average black person something designed to proactively invest and lend to black businesses and something designed to proactively re- recycle wealth within the black community and um yeah um, that's something i've been working on talking to different people and this time i'm feeling a lot better at, about the team i've got and covid has meant i'm having to bring things to market a bit quicker than i expected but i'm feeling excited again and i'm approaching that stage again where i go full time on another venture yeah I, i i know i don't learn right i don't i didn't learn from the first time so i'm definitely looking forward to that wow that's an amazing story i think it's one that our viewers will be very happy to 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 hear to listen to learn from uh Samogan thank you very much for your time uh and as soon as we have uh any further topics that we want to discuss here on uh, other two cents we'll be sure to get in touch with you now before we sign off are you happy for us to uh, share your details out there so that people can get in touch if they want to learn more yeah definitely um people can get in touch with me i think um email or maybe linkedin they can find me on linkedin I'm not that active on Twitter but I'm um, I'm having to become a bit more a- active um uh, Samuel Gan I think on Twitter as well uh, I will double check and let you know what my Twitter handle is but my name on LinkedIn is Samuel Gan um Facebook is hopeless don't don't get in touch with me on Facebook Instagram is also pointless um so Twitter and maybe LinkedIn and the the, the the last thing um I'd like to put out there is that for every um venture out there that's looking to collect money together to invest and um hold people's money 
anyone that's looking for that bank for black people, please, please, please get in touch with me, especially if you've got something going already. Um, please get in, in touch with me. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to speak to people like that. And soon there will be something for the general public to get involved in. So please keep an eye out for that. That's a great final message and a great note on which to sign off. So Samuel Gan, thank you very much. Fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm looking to do a massive fundraise. I, I, um, I, I should have probably mentioned, I'm, I'm looking to do a, a massive fundraise, uh, but trying to do a grassroots fundraising. But as soon as that's done, I'm looking to do um, a recruitment drive. So I'm hoping people get in touch with me because I need to get talented people um, in my, on my radar because as soon as this is done, um, I'm looking to go digital. I'm looking to... Um, have a bank that people can move their money into very quickly. Um, so I will need to recruit talented people. If they're coming to me, that's a lot easier than uh, me having to go search for them because I have a very short window to, to, to do that. And um, yeah, so let them come. Let right. them come. So I, I, I need to... I need it, to it's interesting you say that. When you say you want talented people, what skill sets are you actually after? Because, you know, you don't want a carpenter, do you? <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what sorts of transferable, specific areas of knowledge and expertise are you actually after when you say skills? So, um, uh, g give me a bit of room to give you a bit of context. So, we've been talking about needing to have a, an economic vehicle to be able to um, really combat what's going on. So um, the bit that I know I can contribute is to have a, a financial vehicle that all the different aspects can be put into. So I'm looking to create, firstly, a savings and loans kind of structure. That means that as a block, we can move money from the Western banks into this, but it's supported by the FCA. So you know that your savings are supported just in case I lose my mind, you know that you're covered. And I'm, um, I'm looking, so once that's done, I'm looking to make that available just digitally. So I'm going to need developers. Um, right. um, uh, I'm going to need people that have a bit of banking knowledge to help design new products. I want to very quickly um, find an efficient way to get into the remittance market. Um, so I'm going to need people that understand payments. Um, I'm going to need people that also understand financial education because a lot of black businesses one, there's discrimination when they go for loans. However, um, some of them uh, are just not up to scratch when they go for loans. What I want to do with this is that I'm looking to raise circa 100 million. What I'm looking to do is that if you come asking for 50 grand for your business and your, your, your model is not up to scratch so we can't lend it to you, rather than just declining you, we're going to say to you, all right, this is what your business needs to be able to come up to scratch. So we're going to give you a portion of what you asked for, and we're going to give you the support to build it up. So I'll refer you to analysts that we have independently working with us to help you bring up your okay. business model. So I need people that have those skill sets, and I want to build uh, a selection of templates for modeling your business. A lot of people don't have the skill set to model their business. So I need people that have modeling skills, but can also make it work-based and things like that. So there will be a lot of IT um, kind of stuff needed. And then I'll, I'll need a, a, a customer, a call center, skilled enough to handle any questions that come in, because once we start doing that, people need to be taken care of. So um, I'm going to be looking for people that have the customer service stuff. I want to, I want to make a big push for mothers people that want to have the flexibility to work as and when they need you. Yeah. So I want talented people. I don't want to hire people simply because they're black, because I, 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 I effectively want to hire if completely hundred percent black. That's what I want to do. But if there's a skill set I just can't find within the community, then I'll go outside the community, but I'll be surprised if there's a skill set I can't find in the community. I have that much faith in our community. I've met some, blimmin intelligent people i would be so surprised if there's any skill set that i can't find within our community it's pretty much across the board 
Um, and I think our, our listeners and our viewers will be very pleased to hear that. So, um, I mean, you, you, you've, you've cited ways in which they can get in touch. I'll get that from you formally and I'll, yeah. I'll put that all on the, on the podcast when I edit the video. Uh, so hopefully they, they'll be able to get in touch and hopefully things can, can go from strength to strength from there. Let investors get in touch as well when the time comes. Uh, um, Absolutely. Anyone. The investors are, are, the, are, the, are the key who actually helps sow the seeds, right? And then the hard work is, is, is we caring for, for, for the investment that's been made and, and, and making, it, making it bear fruit at some point down, uh, down the line. So exactly. yes, we will send the word out to everybody. Because technically and business-wise, I don't know if you've seen my website, but I have a range of interests and a whole bunch of stuff. We're doing some very interesting things in the tech space, myself um, and my associates. Uh, so it's interesting to hear to hear you say what you're saying and, and the sorts of things that you want to do. Um, I, I, I've been checking out your website. I, I checked it out before I came, but I know <laughs> you've got some technological skills and um, when the time comes, uh, you will be um, informed <laughs> sure. of what's needed. Uh, sure. uh, so sure. that has not gone amiss at all. Thank you, Samuel. You have a good day. Take care. All right.